This is the Pedernales River. In my part of the hill country, we get our electricity from the Pedernales Electric Co-op. What you see here is just a small part of the wasteful, ostentatious Christmas display that PEC has always done, one of many of the old PEC's excessive behaviors. This story is about the beginning of a revolution, a revolution that rose on four pillars, member activism, aggressive investigative journalism, a member-instituted lawsuit, and a couple of caring legislators. We were also lucky enough to get some help from a couple of great activist organizations. In fact, we were just plain lucky to have all these elements working together in concert to make this revolution really happen. For my part of the story, let's go back to the Pedernales River. This is where Annie and I live, in a straw bale house overlooking that beautiful river for which our electric co-op is named. January of 2006 is when this story began. Being hill country tree huggers, Annie and I thought it would be nice to put something else up on our roof besides our internet satellite dish. We decided it was time we put solar panels on our roof. Some of our friends in Austin were able to do it with big subsidies from the city. We wondered whether our co-op would offer a similar program. If not, we at least wanted to look into a green power option, like another program that Austin Energy offered. So I got on the phone and I called PEC. Hi, I'm calling to find out what kind of programs PEC offers in the way of renewables. Renewables. The woman who answered the phone was very nice, but she knew nothing about any renewables or energy efficiency programs. This was a bit distressing because even I knew that they offered a minimal rebate program, but she seemed unaware of even that. It took a couple more phone calls before I got any information I was after. When I did get the info, I discovered that their programs were set up to discourage participation. There was no help available with on-site generation systems, and the options they did offer were cumbersome and expensive. So we decided not to sign up. But now I was curious about who set up these unenlightened policies, so I called back to ask. Can you tell me their names? Again, I was met with, you want to know what? Eventually, Patty, the account services supervisor, called me and filled me in. It was the board of directors that set all these policies, so I dug into the bylaws to find out more. I knew that the board was elected by the membership, but I wanted to know how they got nominated to run. Well, it turned out that the board appointed a nominating committee, which in turn nominated the incumbents on the board to run for their positions again. I looked at my proxy form and sure enough, all the nominees were sitting board members. No competition. And that explained how some board members had been sitting there for as many as 40 years. The average tenure for all seven voting members at that time was over 24 years. So I called back and asked Patty who was on the nominating committee. She said she couldn't tell me. So thinking that maybe it was time to start finding some new people to run for the board, I asked for a map of the board districts. Patty said there wasn't one, but she sent me a map of the service area districts, which was not the same as the board election districts. I asked Patty to help me out by identifying the board districts. She could not, but she escalated me up once again, this time to a manager named Melinda. The next day I spent quite a bit of time on the phone with Melinda, who apparently had found a board district map and would describe the district's boundaries for me so I could sketch them in on my map. Halfway into the process, I tried to explain to Melinda that I was navigationally challenged. I, I, I'm not good with maps. Could, could you maybe just send me a copy of the board district map and I will then know where the... Why, she said it would be too expensive to send these things to all the members. Well, Okay, I know it would cost a lot to send it to everybody, but you know, I'm not asking that you send it to everybody. Just send it to me, please. She said that wouldn't be fair. Well, can you fax it to me? I have a... F Why not? Is it bigger than 8.5 by 11? She said no, but they couldn't have these things being passed around from member to member. You, you, you mean to say that you think that it would be disinformation if you sent me information? But it's disinformation now because now... Now I am really pissed off. So I write up a report on what I have learned and the incredible difficulty that I had getting any information. And I post it on a community-oriented website that I run. Then in June 2006, Annie and I attended the PEC annual membership meeting. We rose to complain about the things we saw that needed fixing, and noticed that some other members were speaking out about the same problems that we saw. So we went around and got contact information from five or six people. We couldn't get any information from the co-op. When we tried to seek any information, we were met with a stone wall. 
uh, the board meetings uh, were closed. They were held upstairs at uh, the co-op building in Johnson City. Uh, you couldn't get in without seeking special permission from the general manager who made all the decisions there. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, member participation was neither wanted nor tolerated. And uh, we decided that uh, we had uh, had enough of that and it was time for us to try to determine what we could do about it. Myself and some of the neighbors in particular decided it makes sense to nominate alternative candidates for the board elections that were upcoming in the year 2007. There were no free elections. We had a self-perpetuating board. There's actually been very little turnover at PEC. Like my grandfather was on for 38 years and that was typical. There were 17 directors in all, uh, including 10 advisory directors, and not a single one of them had ever stood for a contested or free election. So in March 2007, uh, several of us went in to nominate uh, alternative candidates to those that had been essentially hand-selected at that point. We go over to the Johnson City um, headquarters and Benny Fuelberg comes down and greets us and we go up in the elevator with Benny Fuelberg to go to this meeting in a back room um, where the nominating committee is. The nominating committee, who were seven people, uh, that uh, each one was appointed by one of the seven voting directors. <laughs> and so that's the way self-perpetuating boards operate. We went into a small little room at the PEC headquarters, were ushered in, escorted in I might say. We sat there in this room with this nominating committee who looked like they might be listening to us, but weren't acknowledging anything we said the entire time. Nobody displayed any particular interest in what we were doing, uh, and it was entirely unprecedented as near as I could tell because they didn't, uh, they never had anybody nominated who wasn't already a part of the system. We made our pitch, we asked if we could get on the ballot, and we're basically told nothing. I remember a lawyer was in the room, which I'm not exactly sure who he was representing, but he made mention that they'd get back to us. As I recall, they didn't really get back to us. We had to get back in touch with them, and they told us that um, our candidates uh, had not, been, in fact, been nominated, and that was the end of that. But we demanded again that we be allowed to appear before the board. After examining the bylaws and having been uh, thwarted by the nominating committee earlier that same month, uh, decided that really the bylaws needed attention. Uh, we couldn't break through the nominating process, so we started to look at what was required in terms of nominating board members, what was required for a quorum. The bylaws were in pretty sorry shape, really. We wrote up a bylaw amendment that would provide for putting members on the ballot through a petition process. And uh, that was taken to the board meeting and presented by John Worrell and, and others. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, nothing resulted from it. I remember even at the time the conundrum of how are you going to present to this all-powerful board a series of bylaws changes, modest though they were, that would begin to uh, diminish their own power. And I'm trying to, I remember trying to strategize or you know, kind of tactically is how could you talk a board into kind of giving up its power. Uh, turned out you couldn't, <laughs> but it was worth a try. So we were there uh, at a point where we had tried the nominating committee. They turned us down or, or really ignored us, didn't even answer us. We tried the board uh, and uh, once again, we were met with uh, stony silence. In January of 2007, a reporter for the San Antonio Express News named Roddy Stinson wrote a series of articles in which he revealed the excessive compensation that the PEC board members were receiving. The 17 board members that we had at that time collectively were being paid uh, in excess of $1 million a year. And I read that column and I, and I was surprised and I thought he was actually wrong because my grandfather had been a board member and I knew he hadn't been paid money to be on the board. Originally my role was as husband of Lee Lawrence who was very upset with uh, Bud Burnett because he refused to respond to her letter making inquiries about the compensation of the board. The members were very cut off from having any input. We couldn't email the 
the directors, we couldn't get them to return phone calls, we couldn't get them to return letters, you know, requests for information. They were very, very cut off from the membership. Um, and so the more of that I found out, the more f frustrated I was, but also just the more determined I was with a group of people such as the PEC for You group that sprang up. You know, we all were having this, we all had come from different positions to the very same goal, and that was to try to bring about reform at PEC. She was determined to see that something happened. There were a lot of areas, a lot of areas that we had questions on that it seemed like the only way we were going to get answers was through a lawsuit. And the board itself had basically closed down. They knew that they were now being questioned, so they weren't supplying any information. The co-op in its 70 years had never returned any of the uh, capital to the uh, members. I, in researching uh, the statutes and such came up with this capital credit situation and realized that there would be an incentive for lawyers to get involved in this case. We filed the lawsuit when the Attorney General's office explained they really can't get involved in this area. There were three lead plaintiffs in this lawsuit or class representatives um, and I was one of them. Once that litigation was filed, uh, the rest of us kept the pressure on and wrote a number of letters over the summer of uh, 2007. We went to the annual meeting, we set up a table, we collected signatures, we handed out uh, flyers uh, and tried to enlist other people uh, to begin protesting uh, the closed nature of the, the co-op. We brought signs. We set ourselves up in front of the River Palace in Johnson City, sort of a protest bunch with literature about who we were and what the uh, bad practices of PEC were. And we just stood there in front of the building while all of these um, good old boys and gals came in. They were used to going to the River Palace to um, maybe win a TV or <laughs> win something. I got about 380 votes as a writing candidate, which I was very proud of since it was impossible to get on in any way. Um, but it wasn't enough to obviously win against the incumbents or against the system. It was interesting to watch things dawn on people that there really was no election. It didn't mean anything because you couldn't nominate anybody, <laughs> things like that. And, and you, as you explained this to them, you sort of watched their face kind of take it in. Um, so certainly that kind of hands-on grassroots uh, activity that we did early on, I think galvanized a, a lot of people. Their solution to the uh, complaints that uh, we had made and the, to the class action lawsuit was to hold a series of forums, they call them. Our goal is to hear from our members on the issues that were raised at annual meeting. And we said that we would have these types of forums, and so that's what we're doing. No, I wouldn't call this a forum. We're trying to address all of our members' concerns and all of their comments. Um, we want them to write their comments when they're attending here, and uh, all of those comments, are gonna, we're going to take them and look at them and review them, and then the board will be making their decisions. PEC set up these forums, presumably to respond to this growing unease of the member owners, to let us know ever more firmly all the great things that PEC was doing. And so they had these forums, which were very odd because they really didn't involve any question and answer. They had sort of booths set up, different staff members at different booths with placards, posters, declaring uh, you know, PEC's revenue and breakdown of budget and, and, and various supposed facts. And if you asked a question, the PEC uh, staff member, and they were lovely people. They were mostly young, good-looking, smiley, very smiley. And so they would say, well, I'm not sure, but I'll get back to you on that. It was a kind of marketing attempt. See, we're really good guys. We're really being transparent. We're really sharing with the public all this information. But it was pretty ridiculous. And I think they thought that we would say, oh, good, they are getting information out. So PEC for you can just go away. <laughs> but we didn't. We were keeping the pressure up 
uh, especially to get elections because some of us, and I was one, felt that until the members had an opportunity to elect directors who weren't beholden to the general manager or the management, uh, that we would never get anywhere uh, with the co-op. Uh, the lawsuit was uh, heating up a little bit about that time, and they began taking depositions from uh, Mr. Fuelberg and uh, uh, Mr. Burnett and some of the other directors and managers, and uh, the heat was uh, ratcheting up. The discovery process forced them to um, not lie to us, uh, to not prevaricate, to not hide the ball. They couldn't get through the legal system without beginning to tell the truth about some very uncomfortable questions and the, some of the answers that resulted from those uncomfortable questions was that uh, essentially the chairman of the board did nothing uh, for his hundreds of thousands of dollars of salary. Another thing that was revealed was that the general manager essentially did everything. He controlled everything and he kind of was running an organization, I'm going to say a fear-based organization, based on his uh, knowledge and power. At the uh, board meeting in November, uh, Mr. Fuelberg and Mr. Burnett both announced that they were going to re retire uh, from their positions uh, in the early part of the coming year, 2008, and the board adopted a resolution uh, or a, an amendment to the bylaws that actually went further than the one we had proposed in March. Uh, they abolished the nominating committee altogether and instituted what we had called for, which was a petition process by which members could gather signatures to get their names placed on the ballot. The uh, lawsuit on the one hand and the discovery and the processes require people to tell the truth and, and to come forward and to be straightforward. But uh, they could have done that still relatively secretly had it not been for the, um, uh, the, the Austin American statesmen and the press. We did everything we could to maintain good relations with the press and found a powerful voice in a young reporter for the Austin Statesman named Claudia Grisalis. Claudia would adopt the PEC struggles and scandals as her beat. Other reporters from some of the small Hill Country papers also chimed in with good reporting. But it was mostly Claudia who carried the ball and did some serious investigative work. The, the original group that had gotten together in uh, January, I believe it was, of 2007, eventually evolved into a little bit more formalized but never very formalized group that adopted the name PEC for You. PEC for You actually stayed pretty small, although uh, we had a website and we had an email list, but in terms of the active members, it was pretty small and there were tensions along the way about whether and how we should grow. What we decided was that in terms of active members making decisions, doing things, going to meetings, um, writing literature, that we, that we would stay pretty small, the six, seven, eight really active members, one of whom uh, made us a wonderful website. So we could stay in touch with the world, we could stay in touch through email, we could be completely transparent about what we were doing. But those of us who did stuff, that was a fairly, fairly small group. But the tension never goes away entirely, I think, with grassroots organizations. Um, how, how inclusive to be uh, because it's the right thing to do, but how lean and mean to stay so that you can move quickly, um, take action, um, don't have to spend lots and lots and lots of time coming to consensus because the more people you have, the harder it is to come to consensus. And I think it's an interesting object lesson in a very modern day <laughs> grassroots organization. I think between the press on the one hand, the lawsuit on the other, it really started to force the issue that one or the other probably would have worked, but both of them combined really mattered. Then of course the politicians started paying attention. And between those three elements, um, the PEC had no place to hide anymore. In the spring of 2008, Senator Troy Fraser of uh, Marble Falls held interim hearings on electric co-ops in Texas, focusing primarily on the abuses that had already been uncovered at the Pernellis Electric Cooperative. The legislation was filed by uh, Senator Fraser and Representative Patrick Rose of uh, Dripping Springs that would have required uh, co-ops to uh, adhere to open records and open meetings, which had been one of our demands, and to have free elections, have board meetings open, 
and whatnot. Unhappily, the statewide organization of electric cooperatives in Texas, called the Texas Electric Cooperative, uh, opposed that legislation. Uh, the Perdinalis Electric Co-op Board actually voted to oppose that legislation. From the, the day that we met uh, the nominating committee uh, to the day that the settlement was announced, it was just a year, I mean a year to the day. And uh, everybody that I had talked to and all the attorneys and everybody had cautioned us that this is going to be years to take uh, for, for any results to happen, if we get results at all. But lo and behold, within 365 days, um, the House of Cards crumbled, tumbled. So Mr. Fuelberg left in uh, February of uh, 2008. Mr. Garza came in. Uh, Mr. Uh, Burnett left. And uh, we had, in 2008, the first election that uh, the co-op had ever had. I think there were five positions on the ballot and there were 58 candidates. <laughs> We, we would endorse certain candidates who seemed to be committed to the ideals that we thought PEC should be committed to. Um, good governance, um, and conservation, looking at renewable sources of energy, and so on. So I think our endorsement of candidates meant something. Literally thousands of our Clean Water Action members are co-op members. Public Citizen is a national nonprofit consumer and environmental organization, and we have a lot of members out in the Perdinalis Electric Co op service area. 2008, 2009, 2010, we made endorsements in the PEC board elections. Uh, there were seven voting seats up over those three years, and we helped win five of those seven races. So we helped establish a majority for reform uh, on the Perdinalis Electric Co op. As an organization, we have worked with PEC for you and others to come up with briefings for candidates on what other co-ops are doing around the United States and, and the opportunities for substantial change here. We've worked on governance issues and commented and proposed changes in the way the board is composed or they're selected. It took us three years to uh, get rid of all of the old holdover directors. For the first time, I sat and looked at seven directors who had been freely elected, and uh, five of the seven were uh, individuals that had been endorsed by PEC for you. One of the foremost uh, successes of the lawsuit and the settlement was that we got uh, the PEC to agree to return capital credits, uh, which are like dividends. Uh, back to the members. They had never, PEC had never done that in the entire history of the organization. Uh, another key outcome uh, was this audit that resulted in numerous uh, recommendations for changes that have subsequently, some of, some of which have occurred. The successes are that we now have a relatively progressive board, uh, the majority of whom have run on principles that uh, say we want to do more efficiency and more renewables. As policies, uh, Perdinalis Electric Co-op has now adopted the most aggressive uh, goal for renewable energy of any in the United States, saying they want to have 30 percent of their energy coming from renewables uh, by 2020, and uh, a modest goal that basically says we want 20 percent of our growth in demand for electricity to be reduced through energy efficiency. The first committee they created of members was to look at how to put together the programs necessary to attain those goals and we're deep in the midst of that and have made a number of recommendations to the board on how to implement uh, those programs. It's been about four and a half years now since that first series of calls to PEC to find out about their green programs. Let's see what's going on there now, four and a half years later. Thank you for calling Bridnell Electric. This is Sharon. How may I help you? Yes, I, I was calling because um, I wanted to find out what uh, PEC is currently offering in the way of, of uh, subsidies or incentives uh, to members who want to put uh, renewable uh, installations like uh, solar, rooftop solar, or energy efficiency improvements, do those things if for their home. If you're doing anything on those, the only thing we do have is rebates on if you replace your air conditioning units. That's it, so... That's it at the moment, yes, sir. That's, or commercial lighting. That's, that's really all that you had for the last four or five years. I understand, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much. And you are welcome. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Four and a half years later, the old regime gone, 
an entirely new elected board of directors, new bylaws, a member bill of rights, aggressive goals for renewables and energy efficiency, a highly qualified committee to make recommendations to help meet those goals. And what do we have? No new programs. So I decided to find out if any electric co-ops were doing it right. My quest took me to New Mexico and Colorado. So I'm a, a, an elected director of Delta Montrose Electric Association, which is a medium-sized co-op, 30,000 meters in west central Colorado. It's the economic mainstay of this, of this region, providing not just 100 jobs, but electrifying the region at an affordable price. But we really operate on a three-legged stool instead of just that single leg of uh, low cost. Um, our other two legs that we operate on are uh, we promote renewable energy and we promote, promote energy efficiency programs. And we have been doing this for many years, uh, even before it's been more in vogue in the last couple of years. I think what, what the people of Delta and Montrose counties appreciate is the mix of a very conservative financial approach to electricity. We really squeeze the pennies. And yet, at the same time, we're looking to the future. We have uh, really two, two types of renewable programs. One is a voluntary program in which we purchase uh, wind energy uh, through our power supplier, uh, and we sell that at a uh, discounted price to our members. We currently have about 2,000 customers on that uh, and sell up to about 14% of our energy at, at, during certain times of the year. And then we have a very aggressive solar program, solar PV. Well, you can see the backdrop here. We live in a place where water runs downhill from 12,000 feet of elevation to 4,000 feet of elevation. That water could be generating electricity. We're standing on the banks of uh, what is known as the South Canal, and we will be building uh, at the bottom of this chute uh, a six megawatt uh, hydro generator. The entire project runs about 30 to 40 miles. There's more than uh, 300 feet of drop all the way through that project, and we hope to tap a small portion of this. You know, we live in, a, in an industrialized society that has sort of run away, and, and, it, and it, a, a, rural areas like this are especially victims of it. I mean, the planes fly overhead at 30,000 feet, and we, you know, we have difficult airplane transportation. The electricity comes from hundreds of miles away. We pay their taxes, we support their labor, and so it's all import. And then we sell commodities. There's no reason we couldn't generate that electricity here. I see it as the ultimate in shop at home. We're actually uh, selling uh, wind power at the same cost we get it from, from our power supplier. So Kit Carson doesn't mark up any to ourselves. We think it's an important enough program that uh, we've taken the premium out. And so if we sold it at the premium, we could probably charge about 40 to 50 percent more. We've decided that that's probably not a good idea if you want to really promote renewable energy. The co-op we get our electricity from, Tri-State G&T, was about to borrow billions of dollars to build a huge, pa and they were going to borrow it from Wall Street, not from, not from the federal government as in the past, and they were going to build a huge power plant in Kansas, hundreds of miles away. And they were going to ship, they were going to move the coal hundreds of miles, then they were going to move the electricity hundreds of miles west to us. And we were going to pay interest on that, and we were going to pay for the losses in the transmission. And that just, you know, that was as far away from the roots of the founders of this co-op as you could get. Northern New Mexico has always been a sustainable community, probably for, for hundreds of years. Uh, through Spanish land grants, the Native Americans, uh, you know, when settlers came in, we we're all self-sustaining. And I think over time, uh, that's kind of just our mindset to begin with. Because of the, the technology, it became, it was always cheaper to build a bigger power plant. And so the bigger the power plant, the more centralized it had to be, the farther away it was going to be from a community like this. And now that those economies of scale have reversed, and they've become diseconomies of scale. So suddenly, the economics is pushing you to act locally, to generate the power locally, to be thrifty instead of be wasteful, 
because when when the bigger power plant was always cheaper, produced a per unit byte of electricity cheaper, it made sense to just sell it, market it as fast as you could. So you heated your house with electricity, which is the craziest thing you could possibly heat with. So we're you know you can't you can't row against a tide, but we're I think with the tide now. Uh, we have our uh, the, the assets or the solar arrays that Kit Carson owns. Uh, we have the program in which we'll buy through a purchase power agreement from a developer. Uh, we have a third, which is called Community Solar. We uh, will build a, a, an array in a community. Uh, we'll fund the entire array. Uh, then we'll sell shares back uh, to our members. And they can buy shares based on what they can afford. Uh, then based on the output of that array on a monthly basis, we will then give everyone a credit back on their bill. We mine one and a half percent of America's coal out of this valley and an enormous amount of methane is generated and that methane could generate electricity. Right now it's just exhausted to the atmosphere. Uh, there's all sorts of waste sawdust from our mills. Enough sawdust that if converted to electricity could provide us with 15 percent of our electricity year-round. Uh, and then we have all, the, we have huge dairies, we have the manure. Uh, so there is no reason for us to be s sending 44 million dollars a year to distant power plants for our electricity. W what I see is that electric generation is going to come home. And then we're starting off a uh, solar PV rooftop program. And so uh, we hope those programs cover every segment of the economic uh, uh, foundation here in, in our territory. So there are two kinds of geothermal. There's the geothermal that, you know, I could heat and cool this house with, and DMEA has pioneered that. Anywhere in this country, you can dig down about four feet, and you find the, the constant temperature of the, the earth around 50 degrees. So whether you drill uh, vertically and deep, wells or you use a backhoe and, and go with a four or five foot trench, you can harvest the sun's energy through the earth's crust at 50 degrees. And you pump that up in, through a heat pump process and you pump it into the house. So basically you're mining the heat of the earth and you're pumping it into the house. And uh, the, the process is reversed in, in, the, in the summer where in effect you're uh, diffusing the heat out of the house and pumping it back into the earth. So it's, it's, this is very, very efficient. We kicked off uh, what we believe is, is probably the largest geo-exchange uh, heating and cooling program in the country where we have more than 600 residential uh, geo-exchange installations. We have them in schools and banks and county buildings now. And uh, it is, again, following our mission statement of being efficient. We came up with a uh, parking canopy strategy and now it really has become kind of our workhorse uh, schools, municipalities, uh, the hospital, the, all, they all want these parking canopies because you, uh, you just don't get energy but you get the shade. Uh, during the summer times you get cover from the snow. During the uh, winter times uh, this one behind us generates 100 kW worth of energy which is about 50 percent of this building's needs. So we really are uh, in essence walking the talk. There are supposedly large amounts of hot lava close to the surface up valley where the coal mines are, and that becomes a local generating resource. On KTOW, Solar 1019. Uh, KTOW, the only solar powered radio station in the United States, uh, now has uh, enough abundant power, uh, solar power, uh, to go on for a future, uh, future 50 kW system there. Uh, we have currently the largest array in the state of New Mexico at the University of New Mexico Taos campus where it's generating 100% of their power plus they're also utilizing it for uh, some of their studies and it's become a uh, kind of a place for uh, tourists to go and and get up close to a, uh, a solar array. Uh, we do have one at a eco park here the town of Taos and Taos Municipal Schools uh, eco park which is uh, the first part of the eco park is going to be a uh, uh, soccer fields, three soccer fields. And so its power for concessions and locker rooms uh, will be uh, uh, from the solar array there. And it'll be a parking canopy. So future plans there are to do the lighting through solar and battery storage.
Uh, our intentions are to continue to search and develop all renewable projects in our service territory. But the big majority of what we're doing is a large 30 megawatt installation which is going in in our area. It'll be the, uh, the largest uh, uh, panel uh, solar plant in, in the country once it's installed. Okay, it's pretty clear that these co-ops walk the talk with regard to renewables, but what about efficiency? As far as efficiency programs, we uh, to begin with, we do Energy Star appliances. We sell them at our, at our co-op office. We actually have them in stock. Uh, we give a $100 rebate for uh, refrigerators and for Energy Star related uh, washer and dryers. We also promote uh, high efficiency water heaters. So if someone comes and exchanges out an old inefficient water heater, we'll give them a rebate on a new water heater. Uh, we sell compact fluorescent bulbs and we do, we do a lot of giveaways as well. We kicked off a 100,000 uh, CFL light bulb program where we gave them away to our members. We utilized some of the funds that uh, came from our G&T and we also kicked in uh, more than $100,000 and, uh, and uh, we were uh, able to, uh, in effect, as we promoted this, uh, highly successful. We worked with Walmart. Uh, had a special accounting system, uh, went all the way to the top in working with, with their organization to implement this. And, and over the next few years, we expect to both save our association on peak demand, as well as uh, our, our members, uh, more than $4 million for that, that uh, small investment of a few hundred thousand dollars. We do uh, energy audits for both residential and commercial installations. Well, in, in the program, we'll be proposing for rooftop PV you'll have to get a mandatory energy, energy audit uh, because uh, uh, renewable energy today is more expensive and if you have losses it's more expensive for the member but it also makes sure that uh, the member at times when they're not using renewable energy at, let's say at nighttime have the mo most energy efficiency home uh, or business that they can which allows them to manage uh, their electric bills. We are developing a uh, main street uh, energy efficiency initiative where we will provide those uh, uh, residents and businesses that are the most inefficient uh, uh, funding and, uh, and uh, we will supply a long-term financing package for them where we install windows, insulation, and various things that are the low-hanging fruit, uh, which uh, of course is, is the cheapest generation that we can provide. So we're actively working on those programs right now. Uh, we also do LED Christmas lights and we're promoting other LED uh, lighting such as security lights. And we have formed uh, an organization called FOR, which uh, the acronym F-O-R-E is focused on resource e efficiency. And with this initiative, we have pulled in all of, all of the uh, county, the city, community uh, leaders who have heretofore been fighting and not really come together with regard to most initiatives and they're all sitting around the table now looking at ways to improve the efficiency, energy efficiency in our two counties. So this, uh, this effort is about six months in, into it right now and it's very successful. Everyone's excited about how we can work together as communities and that's really the basis of of being able to really get uh, something accomplished. This is fabulous, but how do these co-ops get to where they are with green programs? One of the, uh, I think, the successes of our program is our board created a, a uh, member solar committee. But there's also uh, uh, board members on that committee. So the, uh, the board members then become the vehicle to promote the members' ideas and, and most uh, recommendations that are taken to the board are, are adopted because we've gone through the vetting process uh, at the committee level and you have board interaction at that level. Our co-op has actually been a member of the Solar Electric Power Association for about 16 years now. So, and I'm a, I'm a board member on that organization, but it's through the, the, my board's support that uh, we're able to do that. And they've, they've supported me being on that board and they support the ideas of integrating solar uh, and wind into the uh, system whenever it makes sense. And so they're, they're a very progressive board. And so the three programs we've talked to you so far about, uh, the, the ones we own, the Purchase Power and the Community Solar, uh, have come from this, this, uh, this uh, collaboration of its members 
and the board figuring out which is the best direction to take when it comes to renewable. Uh, we currently are meeting uh, uh, soon to talk about rooftops and uh, the fourth program and uh, what level of subsidies or uh, what level of uh, credit should we give so that we can incentivize people to also put rooftops. Our focus because of the School of Hard Knocks is a focus on transparency. Uh, we're not unlike most associations. We have nine directors every three years. They go through the election process. Uh, and uh, we do have term, term limits, which is maybe somewhat different than, than many. Well, almost 10% of our membership comes to our annual meeting. We have district elections, so we don't vote for our directors at the annual meeting. We actually run elections, and we have voting machines and uh, election judges, and we have polls. Uh, but the members wanted more. And so we, uh, the board put together a committee to, uh, to see how do we make it more effective, how do we make it more accessible so that more people can vote. Uh, answer all questions, all members. We've opened every meeting, whether it be our, our uh, normal meeting, our special meetings, even our planning, our strategic planning meetings are open to everyone. What we created is a uh, roundtable uh, scenario. and We have both invited and those that through uh, radio and newspaper advertisements uh, come to the meetings. We pick an issue and then we talk about it. And we talk about everything from uh, financing to debt structure to rate structure to governance, election process, bylaws. Uh, they pick the topic and then uh, uh, we debate it. Uh, it. It really has been refreshing because they, they get to understand the inner workings of the cooperative. And what we're finding out from the roundtables is we're getting a lot of positive comments of how to make our programs better. So we've taken people who have been critical and after they see the information, I've said, well, maybe if we do this, you, your program will become, or our program will become much better. So it does also give them an a, a opportunity to give us their ideas of how they, can, how they think the co-op should be run. Our focus on transparency has paid off. You listen to the members, you uh, provide all information, you provide minutes, notes, all kinds of information. Whatever they ask for, you give it to them. As, as any business who has their doors open, and opens their books, you're going to have uh, people uh, challenge your, your decisions and, and maybe want to expand your vision. And, and uh, again, we think that's okay as long as uh, we don't disenfranchise any, any group of people that, that live in our territory. Uh, sometimes it is, uh, does stretch our comfort zone, but that's okay too because I think the status quo isn't going to work for the utility world, certainly not for the cooperative world anymore. Some of these co-ops have drifted away from their roots and they've just become part of the industrial complex that's eating away at our country. Uh, when the members speak, the board listens and so uh, it really hasn't been a difficult process. Uh, our problem is sometimes we have too many people wanting to participate and you only have limited space. What drives me particularly is to bring economic development here by eliminating distant power plants and making the electricity at home. But I don't, I don't care how that electricity is made as long as it conforms to basic environmental rules. I, I will not put this place out on a limb to, to do good. We don't have that luxury. That's for, that's for Aspen, that's for Glenwood Springs. Uh, Denver, Boulder, not for Paonia, Delta, Hotchkiss. And so even someone like me who ran an environmental newspaper for 19 years and is a committed environmentalist can't do that. We, it has to make sense in a dollar way. We understand the need to, to move from, from coal and natural gas to renewables, but we can't do it on the backs of our communities. I'd like to think that maybe my co-op will get there eventually, too. I like the idea of many different technologies competing uh, for attention uh, of, of building owners and, and members of the co-op. Uh, people can make their own decisions about uh, what technology to invest in, whether it's wind or solar or a fuel cell when they become available widely. Uh, the idea is that the co-op should, should uh, um, make changes that are necessary to allow it to look favorably on those kind of distributed 
uh, energy resources. From the feedback that we did get at the annual meeting, we know we need to do better from a standpoint of net metering or um, solar panel incentives. Some way of helping homeowners or at least help the utility itself start generating our own power from, from photovoltaics. And the co-op can do what co-ops have done for many years, which is to help people finance uh, home improvements, uh, to help them finance the appliances that use our product. We used to, to do that, um, and, and co-ops around the country do that today. They f they'll help a, a customer finance a water heater, for example. And we can do that um, uh, in the same way by financing energy efficiency improvements and on-site power generation, possibly. Um, we're also looking at a number of other incentives like zero interest loans or um, other funding programs. Other members benefit even if you don't uh, make a, a, an improvement in your home. Uh, by reducing the, uh, the peak demands, by, by reducing the need for new generation, and these things are, are actually reflected in the, in the co-op's power bill every month almost immediately. What is being done isn't actually being counted toward conservation or actual energy savings within the organization itself. So we don't have any way of documenting accomplishments, even though we have an air conditioning rebate and even though we allow uh, photovoltaics now. The co-op, by, by using distributed energy sources out on its own distribution grid, can avoid uh, a lot of uh, transmission uh, costs, transmission losses, um, and so those things all have to be calculated very rigorously. I would prefer some sort of, of means of, of member input that could be in the form of a blog or in the form of roundtable meetings or some sort of um, formal process for seeking input and then um, having an, a formal evaluation process to vet the good ideas and implement them within the organization. Any of the things that the co-op could do need to be cost effective. We need to make sure that if there's men members money involved um, especially that the things that we're promoting are cost-effective. We should do that anyway. We should promote things that are cost-effective, but if we're contributing a rebate, we need to make sure that there's a benefit that comes back to the system at large. The next step will be for us to prioritize what we think were our good ideas and um, that the, the staff and board should both consider. I think co-ops are uniquely positioned uh, especially the distribution cooperatives uh, to uh, provide a low-cost energy and reliable energy source um, uh, using distributed energy resources which uh, should be a part of I believe any any cooperatives energy supply mix. Well alright I'm stoked solar here we come we keep fiddling around with these fuels that we burn Oil, gas and coal, high dollar and nearly gone We need a fuel that's safe and clean, I'm thinking of the one Waiting in the sky, it's that big hot Texas sun We could light up Fort Worth, solar panels on every roof Amarillo, Texarkana, Dallas and Austin too Shining bright our proud star and energy sugar plum Working for us now, it's that big hot Texas sun